Um, thank you all for coming. This is going to be so much fun, especially on a Friday afternoon when it's a long weekend. Um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, AAC strategies and resources that we have. Robin called us and asked us if we would give you some background on what we have to offer as the AAC team and as well as some resources that we have um, and uh, how the referral process works. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is take this opportunity to show you strategies that you could use for your AAC um, as opposed to just telling you to what we have. And there are two main things that we're going to talk about today that are really applicable for preschool kids. Um, and they're mainly ones oh, that was nice. They're mainly ones that go really for kids who have uh, vocabularies less than 50. So if you can think of how many of you how many of you can think of students that you're working with that have expressive vocabularies of less than 50 words? Get those kiddos in your heads. These are the things that are going to be like super applicable and the most applicable strategies or kids who are using AAC as an alternative way of communicating. Um, the Oftentimes I think we forget that AAC can be helpful for verbal kids because we think, oh, it's just for the kids who can't talk. Um, when it's a really effective strategy and resource for kids who can, but may be considered functionally nonverbal because their vocabularies are so limited and their language use is so limited. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's going to be myself presenting. I'm going to start off. Mary Smithson is with us. She's also going to be helping present. Um, and Paula Joe is also presenting, and so we're all just kind of teaming on this. Uh, for my part, I'm going to be trying, I'm talking about modeling AAC, so you got to kind of walk the walk. So I want to talk a little bit about the system I chose to model. This is not the end of all the system. I wanted to, to explain why I picked it, just so. Yeah? I may have missed this, but what does AAC actually stand for? Oh, that's great. AAC stands for Alternative and Augmentative Communication. So there are two things that that really kind of speaks to. The alternative communication is, is maybe for someone who can't speak and needs an alternative way to go. Augmentative communication is supporting communication. So maybe the child can speak or the individuals can produce some speech, but it's just not efficient or effective and they need some supports where they go. So that's great. Good question. Okay, so for that, for the system that I selected, I selected something called a core vocabulary board. Uh, that's something that Mary will be talking a lot about, what core vocabulary is. Um, for that, just a brief overview, here are lots of words that are super functional. 80% of what we say, we use core vocabulary. Kofi and Mama, I don't know if we can the turn off Kofi the speaker in the library, Mama, but that would be really helpful office. if someone wants to slip out and see if that can happen. That'd be great. So 80% of what we communicate can be compromised with 200 words on our boards. And you use that and you can say actually quite a lot of stuff, okay? Um, the, other re the main reason why I picked it is this is functional and it's usable. Therefore, it is the best board for me. It was very little investment for me to make and learn because it was already printed. And it means I will use it. Um, this that I'm using to kind of bootleg and strap some things on here is this beautiful let's describe board I made while I was in college. I mean, I've got my colors that we can talk about. I've got my triangles. I printed off really nice lettering. Um, I had texture over here. And I had these grand visions of getting textures that you could actually fill. And then we would build sentence strips and describe. Um, I've never used it because I got stuck because I never finished with the texture. And so as awesome as this board is, it really kind of is a piece of crap because I don't use it, right? It's worthless to me, absolutely worthless because it's not usable. So the best board of anything that we offer is really going to be a board that you will use, OK? And there can be barriers. Some barriers can be time to like fix things on your board. For example, Mark Perry. When I first made this communication piece, he was going to be presenting with us and doing some of what Paula Joe was going to do. And in all our spare time, I thought, oh my gosh, to fix my board, I have to pull up board maker, and then I have to print it. We need to cancel the presentation. I can't even do it just because I don't have the board. It's not going to happen. 
um, and it's all over because I'm supposed to be modeling the board and I just don't have time to laminate and then the laminator takes a half an hour to warm up and I can't use the board unless it's laminated and so we're dead in the water, right? We put the, it becomes crap and we put it in the closet and we don't use it because we're missing one picture or we can use a strategy and say, hey, Paula Jo, my new student that's here today that I don't have on my board, can I just turn this on first mm -hmm. is probably a good thing. Sure. <laughs> and, and maybe it won't work. I tested it like three okay. times with people. <laughs> oh, oh, oh it worked. Okay, surprise. Welcome to my class. You know, there are other things too, like, some people just didn't have time to email me pictures, and I had some people that I could make up stories about, like Amy Finch, I know that she likes a lizard, but I have never met Brooke Bentley before. Who's Brooke Bentley? Oh, Brooke. Hi. I just need your picture real quick. Okay. And I've never met Sarah Daniels before. Sarah Daniels here. Sarah! Can I just grab your picture real quick? Okay, so all of a sudden by using this really quick strategy, now my board's not perfect, and believe me, for anyone who is obsessive compulsive in the audience like I am, with my typed, yes, they are typed, note cards that I am presenting with, you can see how anxiety provoking this is for me. But all of a sudden it makes my board a usable board within five seconds. I didn't have to pull out board maker for that new student that was gonna come all of a sudden, Mark is no longer Mark. He is Paula Joe, and my presentation can move forward. And it was just as easy as that. So that's one strategy. And that was a barrier that I was kind of having, and that was very anxiety provoking for me. And it's fixed like that. So this is a Polaroid camera, basically. So this is an Instamax, right? Who would have thought AAC device? Whoop, whoop. Okay, $60 at Target. My niece gave it to me for Christmas because I like photography. And at first I was like, yay, Polaroid, where am I going to take pictures? And then I was like, this is brilliant. I can fix my boards that I'm having heart attacks over because I don't want to pull out board maker to print them. And then I'm set. And at least I can be lazy until, not lazy, right? Because we're all spread so thin. At least I can have my new students on the board for my communication system or add them on there until I can finally have access to BoardMaker and the color printer that is in the library and down the hall and have the half hour to turn to wait for the laminator to warm up and then I miss the window and another half hour to have it warm up again to laminate my board, you know? So, so it gets me by in between, okay? There were other picture boards that I was having a hard time with that was a barrier to me using this for presenta presenting and it was two more things that I wanted to do I wanted to add like um, SLP to my vocabulary list so another strategy I have is just a sharpie and post-it notes so here's my little SLP picture stick figure of someone talking SLP there we go I have a word for SLP now um, teacher I want a teacher word for teacher just drew a little stick figure of teacher that's going to get me by. So no need to not use my AAC system because I've got some strategies to extrapolate there. And these are things and tools that you have always. Okay, so now I can breathe because I have my words and we can move on. All right, so our, in, our presentation in objectives, I want to go over introductions mainly because I want to model something that you could do with your students using an AAC board as a strategy. I want to, we're, we're also going to talk about the assistive technology team, who we are, what we do. Robin requested that. AAC strategies, two main strategies we're going to be going over. Aided language stimulation, why that's important, as well as core vocabulary as a strategy. Paula Joe is going to talk about um, materials that we have available that are that mainly appropriate for functional life skills and preschool. Um, skills and then we're also going to go over how and who to contact for if you're interested in any of these things. Um, okay, so the first thing I wanted to model was introductions. Uh, and again, this is just to model, we, just, we might as well do this. Okay, so um, Amy Finch, can you please stand up? Thank you. Okay, this is 
Amy, I should warn you, this is the first time I've used the board in public, so I'm petrified, so I'm learning with you. Okay. She is, she is an SLP. Okay. Um, and she likes lizards because they hide from her and she has to find them. Okay. All right. So Claire Fawson is not here. So let's go ahead and go with Colette, who is here. Uh, Colette, please stand up. Okay. If you can't, yeah, you can sit up. Colette is an SLP. She likes babies. She's going to have a baby. <laughs> so that is, that is a picture of a bottle on the board there. Um, okay, let's have Connie. Con Connie was here, and now she, now, she is not here, but I'm sure you guys know who Connie is. Lynn is, oh, where's my not, not here. Um, Shannon is not here. Uh, but we do have Monica is here. So Monica, please stand up. Okay, Monica is a teacher. Okay, thanks Monica, you can sit down. Okay, uh, we also have Brooke. Brooke is here. She is a teacher, okay? Brooke, you can, well I won't make everyone stand up. because <laughs> Now you get the idea, but can you see how many words I'm using from this that are kind of core vocabulary words and modeling? Monica? Um, just like, just, I, I know seeing from here, so I don't know how they're getting it over there, but I can't yeah. even. You I can't quite pointing, see. But I don't know if a pointer, if you ever use a pointer with your system or something. You so know, kids can see or that is a great question. So now, this is the first time I've modeled this in front of anyone. Oh, so right. I don't have a class that I can use that with. So this is my first time using it. So I haven't even thought of that. So a pointer, I think, is an excellent strategy or idea. And I'm looking around. Oh, and there's one right here. OK. So we now have a pointer. So this is awesome. OK, so let's try, um, have I missed anyone? Is Danielle, is she here? Danielle here? Oh, there you are. Danielle. Danielle is a teacher, and she likes to quilt, OK? Um, we, we also have with us, with us, we have um, we have some functional life skill teachers. Jesse Fiat is a functional life skill teacher. Sarah Daniels, if you could wave, she is a functional life skills teacher. Uh, Lisa Gifford is a functional life skills teacher. Liz Payne is also a functional life skills teacher. Okay, um, let's see. Lisa likes, likes to go to her cabin that is by a little river, which I thought sounded like that would be fun. Okay, of course, Robin Rector is here. Robin is um, over the preschool SLPs and teachers for the preschool staff. We also have, let's see, we... We have Cindy Myers, who is, who, who is here. And Cindy Myers um, loves her pet pig, Rosie, which I loved that about Cindy, OK? I am Amy. I, I like to hike, OK? Um, Mary, this is Mary. Okay. And she likes to read. She likes to read. Um, Paula Joe 
is here to help. And I am so glad, so glad that she is, he is here to show us some of the devices too. Um, and she, she likes to listen to her son's band music. Yes. Okay. So she, she has no choice but to listen, to listen to his music. Okay. All right. So if you're wanting to get some sentences in there for your kids, who is here today? Who is here? Think of how many times you could get that as repetitions if you did that introductions for your circle routine. Okay. So much of the, is, this is core vocabulary. Okay. All right. So those are my introductions. So the next thing, this is our assistive technology team. Okay, this is kind of who we are, our email addresses. The basically, the most informative way I could sum up what we do is we support and coordinate with multidisciplinary educational and rehabilitative teams to train students, caregivers, educators, and service providers in the use of assistive technology in education and in the major life functions of students with disabilities. That's kind of a mouthful and very well put, I think. So basically, um, we, the augmentative, right, is to support. So if there's anything that we can support students assistive to assist with or alternative, anything that might be alternative ways to help them express themselves or show their learning needs. Anything that, let's see, um, Paula Jo or Mary is, there, there's a there here. No, not on this one, never mind. Yeah, oh, okay. where is it? Next to, good. Next to good. Oh, you're right. Is there anything you want to add? Not right now. Okay. All right. So, what is language stimulation? So, AAC strategy, this is the most powerful strategy in the AAC literature. And basically, it's modeling. It's nothing no novel. It's something that we do all the time. And we, it's how we learn language, OK? And it starts off, we do it naturally. We do it with beginning communicators. You see a baby, and all of a sudden, we're just compelled to talk at the baby. Not even talk with, we talk at. So this is an example of something that I found to show you. Now, as we watch this video, though, I want you guys to tally some things, like in your mind. First thing I want you to do is I want you to tally keywords that the dad models, okay? How many times he models some keywords. See if you can pick out what he's trying to get her to say. It's a little tricky. Um, the second one I want you to pay attention to is the reinforcement, reinforcement he gets from Ava. Okay, that reinforcement can come in the forms of smiles. It can come in the form of reaching. It can come in the form of touching. It can come in the form of vocalizations. And it can come in the form of laughs. Okay, so Tally, dad's stimulation and his reinforcement from Ava is what we want to watch. That mom, hold on for a second. Hold on. Who's this? Who's this? Who's this? Who's dad? Dad? Ava, 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 Dad, 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 Dada? Dada? <laughs> Dada? 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 Can you say dad? Dad? Okay, I think we kind of get the idea. All right, so how many times is he modeling keywords? A lot. A lot, every second. Any idea what the keywords are? 
<laughs> okay, this is something that we just naturally do all the time. What kind of reinforcement is he getting from the child? Laughing, reaching, smiles, some touch. There's one point where she goes and she mouths his chin and she's like, ah, you know. And, and it's just this highly engaging interaction where both parties are super reinforced. And that's basically what language stimulation is. And, and I think sometimes our kids with disabilities, we miss out on how much they miss out on early on in life because they didn't have the sensory input to be able to have these experiences. And, and we need to recreate that for them with aided language stimulation, which I'm sure you probably already know where I'm going with this, right? Okay, all right, so if I were to like categorize those interactions, I would probably make it look like this, where we've got lots of reinforcement for Ava's interactions of what she's getting with dad, where they've got a lot, not, lot of nice give and take here. We have mom in here, but how much are dad and mom interacting? Really not a whole lot. And a lot of that is because they're getting so much reinforcement from Ava and they're so engaged with what she's doing and how she's reinforcing them with her productions. Okay, So they do make some comments to each other you know, about Ava, but it's not a whole lot and it doesn't take away from the interaction or the language stimulation that's directed to Ava. Does that make sense? That's an important point that you want to, want to come back to. Okay. All right, sorry, I've got so much technology that I don't know what to do with myself. Okay, oh, and my type note cards, where did they go? All right, okay, good. Diagram, let's make sure that I did that. All right, so stats on social modeling. Social modeling is basically how we learn language. We basically see other people do it. We copy other people's communication systems. We talk because we see other people talking. And, you know, because we can learn that, okay? AAC people who are successful using AAC situations do it because they see other people using AAC around them. All right, so stats on modeling. By the time a child is speaking, you know, they have had 4,400 hours of verbal language modeling, okay? That's the equivalent of almost four school years of all day modeling, like the kid not talking at all, just all day modeling, talking at the kid. Four school years straight of that. That's how much time that is. Crazy. Because it just so naturally comes, and you could see how that would be watching dad. Ava probably has more than the 440,000 by the time she becomes a communicator, okay? Power of language stimulation, why is this so cool? Well, it has to do with the amount and the quality of the stimulation, okay? Um, so the language stimulation totaled from birth to three years of age um, is a predictive variable and associated with skills all the way, they followed them at age six and then the researchers followed up again at age nine and it was predictive for IQ, predictive for vocabulary and language skills, it was predicted for language processing speed. Kids who had more language stimulation had a higher rate of um, processing speed. Now, not causal, there's no way we could define causal, right? But it was predictive. You could predict it with increased language stimulation, they had increased processing speeds. It was also associated with increased academic achievement. So this is huge, huge. And, oh, there are other things that are totally crazy with this. Um, it is stronger than SES. So even when you had impoverished environments, if the language stimulation was higher in that environment, it overtook, it weighed out the SES, socioeconomic status of that. So the, the, there's this great book out, 30 Million Words. Maybe you've read it, or maybe not. I listen to a lot of NPR. Okay. All right. Um, okay. All right, so what about our students with disabilities? Okay. So students with disabilities. Oh, another point I wanted to make. Language is symbol-infused joint attention. Okay. But oral language it just happens to be this. The oral vocalizations happens to be the symbol we're jointly attending to. Okay. So what about our kids with disabilities that disrupt that? What if they can't attend to that symbol? Okay. 
The easiest one I think we have to compare it to is kids with hearing impairments, okay? Um, that, that, that's easy enough. What do we do with kids with hearing impairments? We change the symbol, right? Because they can't hear the symbol, so we change or we modify or we augment the symbol with sign. And it's super easy to do with that. Like, it's totally acceptable in our culture. Kids, when they have, parents, when they have a child who is deaf, they'll start immediately with sign. Surgeons will really encourage use of sign. Um, even if we know that they're going to be implanted by the first year of birthday. And they see better outcomes for kids who had signing, aided, basically, joint, symbol-infused joint attention stimulation through sign from zero to one than the kids who don't have that before they get their cochlear implant, even though they're, they're both hearing before they're supposed to talk, right? Um, okay, uh, sometimes I think this is important because we might have autism who don't jointly attend to symbols, so we might need to address that as well as opposed to just offering another alternative. Um, or sometimes we have kids with, um, with maybe some cognitive delays or something that, that maybe it's not as clear cut as they can't hear the symbol, but they can't process vocal symbols or remember them as well. And so maybe we need to bootstrap on some other things to, to help them learn. Um, help them, see now I'm getting all excited about this. I'm forgetting to use my board and I'm supposed to be modeling this for you all the time that we use this all the time, all the time for those 404,000 hours of that, okay? So, so it's a challenge with our kids with, with disabilities. So we've got our hearing impairments. Okay, so it's the easiest one to, to see. I think I talked about that. And I told you they see better outcomes with the kids who start with sign even though they get the implants and they're, they're hearing later. Okay, so other disabilities. All right. So, okay, so we have a couple choices here. Oral language, these are the areas we're working with in the brain here. Okay, so if we just use oral language when we're communicating with our kids, this is what we're going to get. And a lot of times our kids, I think it's pretty safe to say, if they're in our functional life skill classes or things like that, a lot of them have cognitive impairments or language impairments where this area isn't even working that great. So it's not like we have everything we can work with in those neuron areas. So what we need to do is we need to recruit other areas of the brain to be activated when we're communicating with them. And that's what aided language does. It, they've done fMRI studies with kids, and this is really pretty cool because, um, because not only is the language center activated, but because they're having to move to get to the pictures and they see those movements, all of a sudden we get motor areas activated. And then you can even tack on to motor memory for where um, where these icons are, you know, so so where the icons are. If you keep them stable, you can't keep shifting them and having them in different places to be able to tack on to that. You get to access visual memory of the kid. Um, you also access their visual areas of their brain by associating it with a picture to help just recruit more neurons for their learning. So this doesn't become something that we just do for them to do with us. This is a strategy that we really need to be using with our kids to help them learn, help them learn language and learn just anything in our classroom. Um, and we do that by recruiting some of those, those neurons. And I found that to be fascinating that motor learning would kind of help recruit in that memory for AAC communication as well as visual memory to kind of come on that online there. So we've got kids with difficulties with auditory memory and some of those other things. You know, this can be a really awesome strategy for us to use with our communication. Okay. All right. So what does aided language stimulation look like? Okay. So I just want to point out with that language stimulation, did the dad really even expect anything from Ava? Or do we expect anything from our babies when we talk to them early on? But does he require her to make a vocalization and a perfect vocalization from what he has? Or does he even really expect that she's going to say dad at this point? 
do we expect a three-month-old to say mama as we kind of stimulate that and model that for them at that stage? No, and I think we skip that stage when we do AAC. We jump right to them using it with us as opposed to modeling it for them. You know, I think we forget that AAC is actually a language in and of itself that we need to take the time to model and teach, okay? So aided language stimulation looks like this. Mom, hold on for a second. Hold on. Who's this? Key words. Who's this? Who's this? Who's dad? Dad? Ava? 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 Dad? 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 Okay. So. Sounds Chinese. Dad? You get the idea. It's pointing out keywords as you use them. Of course, verbally, and you know, I'm not going to talk over the dad, but you would point out keywords as you do it. You know, I don't have all the words that I'm pointing to at this point, but I've got my keywords that that I'm highlighting. Okay. Any questions about what aided stimulation is? It's basically what I've been trying to model the whole time with my board. Okay. Um, One of the things that's cool about this, I did mention that it's one of the most effective strategies in all of the AAC literature. Uh, some of that I want to make it clear. It doesn't matter what system you're using, right? Remember my crap system here that I spent like 40 hours on, but it doesn't work because I don't use it, okay? We've got lots of systems. They go from bliss symbolics to Pixon to whatever, but the key ingredient for whatever they're successful with is that they're used by the communication partners. And that's one of the number one predictive factors on whether or not an AAC device is going to be abandoned or not, is whether or not the communication partner is modeling it. And I have a couple theories why I think that that's important too. One of them is I think it builds an empathy and wait time for our AAC users that we miss out on otherwise. I think if we're using it, we kind of understand like, oh, this takes a little longer. So we give them the time that they need for that conversation and, and your interactions are a little bit more inclusive. Um, I also think if you understand how to use it, you can teach it better. Um, so back to some points that Colette, Ms. Colette so brilliantly uh, thought of, okay? So remember that diagram that I talked about with the interaction with Ava and that, like, you know, it was such a nice, feedback loop of reaching for dad and sucking on his face and the da 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 and all that, okay? Children with disabilities look very different in our interactions, especially if there's another communication partner in the room. And let, that this is just kind of what naturally happens sometimes if people aren't talked to about this because um, oftentimes you don't get a lot of that feedback. So. Oftentimes, communication partners were focused most of their time talking to each other and not very much time interacting or, or stimulating the kiddo with a disability. And this was really sad in the 50s. They were, I think it was the 50s, maybe it was the 30s. But there was some literature that was coming out with autism about kids not talking with their moms. And then they looked at these moms and the moms had this really kind of flat, they were so depressed because they're not getting any feedback from the kids. Well, researchers misinterpreted that information and called it refrigerator mothers, and they said that that was the cause of the autism and all that kind of stuff. It was really kind of horrific. And I, I mean, can you imagine being a parent like in that situation? So, so they noticed it kind of relatively on, as, as researchers got smarter, they realized, oh, parents are being reinforced, and so they're pulling back, not getting that engagement that they need, and it's hard to kind of maintain that when you're not given feedback to go. And in schools, too, they see sometimes, like, during feeding time, even if you're working on AAC snack time with your kids, you know, and this is, just kind of be aware, there's no judgment here. This is normal, what happens in normal situations. So they might be working with a kid, like, more you want to eat? And, and the kid kind of maybe isn't and is engaged, and they start the the adults in the room will start talking to each other like, oh, so how was your weekend? Yeah? Oh, that, that was good. Oh, more? You know, it's, it can be kind of natural to do. Or toileting instead of talking and engaging with the kid. If you've got someone sitting on the toilet and you've got your assistant in the room, it's more like, 
Well, what, did you see that new movie that was out? Yeah, that was pretty good. Are you done yet? <laughs> Do you know, it's without that feedback loop, we're in great risk of not engaging with our kids even less. And this is so ironic to me because there are kids who need it more than, than anyone. But that's just kind of what they find in the research. Okay, oh, but effect size. Is it, are people familiar with what effect size is? Okay, good. Um, effect size is something that in the last 10 years, research has really been just kind of looking at to see what the, the deal is. So we know a strategy is effective, and we know aided language stimulation is effective. Um, but then effect size asks like, well, so how much do we care? You know, we, if, if we hear that men are making more than women, and the difference, and it's statistically significant, but that difference is only $5, that's a small effect size. I'm probably not gonna write my legislature about $5 to make that change. But if we find that it's you know, $1,000 a paycheck, yeah, I'm gonna take the time and write Obama and be like, dude, where is our problem with that? That would be a large effect size, okay? What they want to see for us to do anything about our interventions is something from anywhere between a medium effect size and it goes up to a very large effect size. Um, for aided language stimulation, the impact this has on our kids is a very large effect size. Like the calculation that they use to calculate the statistic goes up to one. And for most populations, it's like 0 0.98, 0 0.99, something like this. So this is a powerful strategy to be using with our kids. Uh, for autism, though, that effect size drops down to only moderate, so still enough we care, right? Um, but they do think that that could be because they have issues with joint attention anyway, so they've got more things that they've got to work on. We might want to be mindful of those things. Okay, so it's cool stuff. And then example is not the main thing in influencing others, it's the only thing. Okay, so what materials do we have? for you to do with this. Um, we have a lot of materials, okay? We've got switches that you can use, and Paula Jo, I think, has brought some um, that you could use that. We've got GoTalks you can use. We have iPad apps like Talk Tablet. We have iGaze boards that you could use. This is an example of something that you could use. Um, the Pixel Library is something that you could use. You can make your own boards with BoardMaker. You can make them interactive. So if this is something that you would be interested in trying in your classroom, we have a lot of augmentative support that we could give you to do that and, and help you with that. Um, okay, so this is just a reminder, let's not throw the baby out with the bath water, okay? I think sometimes when we try to encourage teachers to try new strategies, it's like, I have my lesson plans. I, am I gonna have to develop whole new lesson plans that match my board and, and everything? And this has got way too much time to do. I, I can't do it. And I can't use the board because I don't have Paula Jo on it yet. Um, and that's not necessarily the point with this. Language, aided language stimulation is about you keep your lesson plans, just add this to it. You know, do everything the same way that you're doing. Just see what you can do to add the board to your routine. Um, and then so I just had, I was gonna set my timer so I didn't go too far over. Am I like really, how are we on time? Am I taking, how much time have I taken? It's 218. 218, oh my, what did I, I don't know how to start it. 35 minutes? Okay, good. Okay. So I just want to show you really quickly on how you can integrate it, and this will take five minutes and then I'll be done, into things you're already doing. So your morning routines, that's why I took the time to do the introductions the way that I did. If you've got a scripted routine, you could do that. Um, when I was in um, a speech therapist for the preschool, I made this really cute book that matched brown bear, brown bear. You know, what do you, who do you see? And it was the kids, it was each kid in the class, you know, who you see. You could do that with this so much easier. I wish I knew what that was. We could say, Amy, Amy, who do you see? See. And then Amy could, you know, I see Claire um, looking at me. 
Isn't that nice how much of that vocabulary that I didn't have to make a new board or anything like that? My core's there if something comes up that I don't have. So you could use it in your routines, okay? You could use it for storytelling, like I was saying, for that brown bear. And instead of this, which I have when I taught brown bear, which was a lot of pictures, and I would be like, okay, Kent, can you find brown? You know, and then we would take the time to put that here, you know? What if I just go, brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? And I've got all my cork here, but I just added a little bit of French vocabulary that's not coming up that wasn't there. So you could use it for storytelling and, and really model some nice sentence uses. Um, you could use it for toileting which is something that I think a lot of functional life skill teachers are doing or things like that, okay? Like, all right, I need to change you. You are wet. You are wet, wet, wet pants, wet, right? That's what we do when we're teaching kids oral language. Um, and then if we are modeling this enough day after day on those routines, you know, they'll start picking up, hey, now, uh, you know, all right, lift you, lift you, we need to lift you, okay, change you, change you, I need to change you, um, you know, wipe, They're just those basic toileting things that you could augment or use for that and you've got your vocabulary there that you could add on, okay? Um, so yeah, integrating it as opposed to feeling like you need to do whole new lesson plans for each thing that you want to teach. Okay. Um, and then what we can expect to kind of get if we start to move this direction is hopefully John, aided language simulation plus core vocabulary equals John. And that's how I kind of got into this Gail Van Houten tip, Van Tatenhoff, that I can't pronounce her name, um, who I think is amazing. I emailed her as I prepared for some of this, and she was very helpful with a lot of information. She presented a most powerful video of this guy who only uses 144 picture symbols on his board, but he's able to communicate some pretty incredibly powerful things, some abuse that happened to him in the center. And she uses all aided language stimulation with her group with her Hi. aided communicators. But John, you've told me quite a story. Why don't you hit speak display so everybody can hear the whole story? Thank you. It was time to eat. I wait and wait. No one there. No one come. I am afraid no one here but help me eat. I wait more. She come and say to me you don't tell. She mad and me. She go away. I wait more. Well, I'm glad you could tell me about it. Is there something you need me to do to fix it? You can take care of it yourself. Excellent. Okay. Even with this board, the words on this board, it can give you something to communicate something that powerful. So um, that's why I am on the soapbox in the aided language stimulation train. Um, yeah, and we've got, if you want to use that as strategy, we have a lot of tools that can help you. Um, so now, um, with core vocabulary, I'll turn the time over to Mary to tell you more what that is. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we need to get to my <coughs> All right, so 
Amy's done a really great job of talking about aided language uh, stimulation and why it's so important. What I'm going to talk about is uh, a, a method to do that, okay? And there's a lot of different ways to do uh, aided language stimulation. I'm going to talk about core vocabulary and why it's been useful for me in my classroom at Ensign. Um, let's see. It is. Okay, what is core vocabulary? So instead of having tons and tons of words, Amy talked about the 200 words that we use over and over and over again. So it's just a commonly set of, uh, set of words that we can use and communicate with in a lot of different ways. Um, so one picture can actually stand for more than one meaning or you can use it in a variety of ways. For instance, we've got um, on our little board, we've got help, but you don't just have to do help. It can be when you're a helper in the classroom. So you can use that same picture in, in more than one way. Um, so rather than creating like these pictures and pictures and pictures of individual things, so you have a picture of a marker and you have a picture of a book and you have a picture of the cow with the, with the ball in its mouth um, to be able to communicate with, you just have this core set that you can use over and over as, as Amy did. So it allows students to not only request things, but you can do commenting, you can protest, you can ask for repetition, you can ask for more, you can ask for help. So a lot of different pragmatic functions you're able to get to with the core vocabulary rather than just a huge bunch of pictures that you use kind of randomly. All right, so common high frequency words, they're reusable. Um, you can use them across language functions and contexts. They're descriptive and they're always available. Amy showed that, demonstrated that very nicely. All right, so for a toddler, and, and in preschool, we've kind of got toddler language, right? <laughs> so 96.3% of a toddler's communication consists of these words. There's 23 words there. 23 words. 96% of the time, they're going to use those words. So it would be, in my mind, an advantage to use a system that used at least most of those words on the communication board. So you can model that. All right, so here's an example right here. Here's an example of a core vocabulary. Um, and I'm going to send around an example. So there's 20 words on this board. A lot less. How many do you have on yours, Amy? That one has 77, but I added OK, so there's some extra ones there. So in our preschool class, we started with 20. That is so overwhelming for me. I was like, oh my gosh, I could not start with that. It's too many words. And especially with our preschoolers, we don't need to start with that many words. OK, so this has 20 words. And I think 10 of the 10 of the words on here, or 13 of the words on here, are on that previous list of the 23. So a good portion of it. Now here's what we often see um, is just a whole bunch of pictures so that we have, so they could say, I want to cut, I want glue, I want paper, I want markers, I want crayons. And that's fine. We need that vocabulary too. But we don't need it all the time. We don't need to have it accessible all the time. And here, pretty much, is all you can do really is kind of request it. With this, we can do a lot of other things rather than just do requesting. OK, so I want to talk about why I started to use the vocabulary, core vocabulary approach. First of all, I have to fess up that I have been a PEX lover. Love, love, love PEX got trained many years ago, right at the beginning. It was probably like 22 years ago. I got trained into the, the three-day session or whatever. And um, Kathy Murphy, who I worked with, did it. Robin did it with me. Did you go with us? Yeah, it was, and it was great. And I loved it because it gave me something to do with kids. And I found that I could use PECs with kids, not just that had autism, but had low language, like 50 words or under that were pretty much nonverbal, but couldn't communicate. This was a way to provide something for them. And I saw really great gains because they started to use this communication, doing a lot of requesting. Mostly in our preschool classroom, we were able to do it at snack time. It was hard to do it in other times um, because the kids had to be motivated. They had to want something. Um, and a lot of times in small groups, yeah, they didn't want to cut, they didn't want to cover. So you can't do pecs if they're not motivated. 
Um, but we did it, and then kids started using verbal language because PEX is wonderful. It builds in where you pause, I want cookie, and you wait for it, and they start to fill it in. And so it was great. I love PEX. Helped many, many of my students. But there were some drawbacks, too. And um, it was most successful when I had, when I worked with Kathy, who had gone through the training with me. We were both on the same page. We both knew what to do. And we were able to train our assistants because we both had that training. Uh, more difficult in a new environment with a different teacher who hadn't been trained and didn't have tons and tons of pictures like we'd developed over the years. Um, it was also hard to do pecs, like I said, really couldn't take pecs out on playground. It's really hard to take, you know, how many what pictures are you supposed to take? All of a sudden we had something for snack that we didn't have a picture of. Somebody, a parent brought in something else that we had never had. We didn't have a picture of it. We didn't have Amy's little <laughs> camera either. Um, but those were difficult. If we had a student who um, really was pretty passive and, and really it wasn't somebody who wanted to grab at things, it was hard to train them to use PECs. So there were some problems with it. Um, so I attended some sessions with Gail Van Tatenhall and was really encouraged and really excited about using the core vocabulary approach. So on our UAC team, we ordered Pixon vocabulary because that's what Gail has developed. And it, it sat there. I checked one out, it sat there. <laughs> and I take out the manual sometimes and look at it and go, hmm, that would really be good. Didn't do it. Until she came around again and um, got a hold of Marilyn Price Larson and Mark Perry, and they started using it at Dilworth in their uh, very severe functional life skills, their medically fragile kids. And they were using it with eye gaze. And this kid was, was using it and doing it. And it was like, wow, this is really cool. And somebody's already kind of tried it. And they know the ropes. They know how to get started. So that's when I brought it in. I started using it last March, April. I've only been doing this for a year. And I'm, so I'm still a beginner. I'm still learning how to do it. But, but it kind of changed. It changed my life. <laughs> Okay, so we did pick picks on. It's easily available. It's a program we had already in our cupboard right when Marilyn and Mark started it. Um, we had gone to a training by Gail. Um, the materials were fairly, were pretty easy to prepare. They were, she has CDs, so you can put the CD in and print out a board. Um, you don't have to have tons of pictures and so forth, so it's easy to get up and going. It could meet individual needs could do it with the direct select. We could do it with kids who could just do eye gaze. Um, and you can do it with kids with like PRC devices. You could do it with talk tablet or if you have ProLoquo or something, you can also use the same kind of board on there and, and make it up. And it was very easy. Don't you think, Christina, it's pretty easy for staff to get going and, and get an idea of how to use it? You didn't need three days of training to do it. Okay, so here are some of the Pixon materials. And we do have, Paula Joe. do we have still some of the kits available? Um, right now, we, we don't, they're all checked out. Okay. But we're looking at it. Um, but we could purchase more. Purchases. Right, okay. So here's, I think, maybe a 50, 50 picture board. Um, and I'm gonna pass around so you can take a look at it. The 20 picture board. So we've got a number of these in our classroom. Um, that we use, and I can't remember what I was going to say about it. I'll just pass it around, I'll think of it later. So you can take a look at it. Pass that around. And then, okay, so then there's the 30 board. Oh, what I was going to tell you is that the Pixon pictures are from PRC and they're MinSpeak pictures. And if you're familiar with that, they're goofy. I just have to say they are goofy, goofy. So, um, I don't know how they came up with them, but not many people, I don't think any people, anybody likes them. <laughs> for like, for the picture for now, they have a naked man getting into a tub. Now, does that immediately make you think, oh, now? <laughs> no, it's, it, it, they're really weird. So, um, Did they change that? Changed the, so, we oh. changed them to the board maker symbols, which is much more familiar. It just makes a little more sense. It doesn't really matter to the kids. 
whatever we model, they're going to pick up and realize, oh, that symbol means now. So they could, I mean, they could do with the naked magazine. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? You could use real pictures. Yeah. It's not like confined to them. You can use, you could make up your own. But this we got made. It's also on the Board Maker Share site. Already done. Okay. And it is color coded based on pronouns, uh, verbs, descriptive words, and so forth, kind of color coded. Okay. So you can take a look at that. Now, the, um, the next one is a 30 icon picture board. I changed this. So I got this out because we've got some kids that are, are going to start to need to transition to the 30 picture board because they're ready for it. Um, but the way it was designed with Pixon, even with the, with the board maker symbols, the pictures weren't right in the same spot. They were kind of in the same area. For instance, like if, if stop is here, like on this picture board, stop's clear over there. And I'm a slow, I'm a slow learner. I mean, I was working with it, and and it kept like being over here, and so I want to go here when I was talking to him about stop, and it would take me longer. So I rearranged the symbols. So I've got all these symbols that are on the 20 picture board, stop, want, look, and help. They're still down in this corner. So, so I just have to learn some of the new stuff. Uh, this is like, and it's go, and it's get and eat and drink are different. But I can learn the new positions as long as I know the old ones are right in the same spot. So I rearranged it, and I've got it on board maker that I can share with anybody. So okay? the ones you're using are not Pixon? They're Pixon-based. And the Pixon pictures are the MinSpeak pictures. But we've got them to be able to share if you want to use this. So I'm going to send that around, and you can maybe send it around with this one so you can kind of compare they're in the same spot. Then I also have another thing. Now see, this has been a year, so I didn't do this all at once. <laughs> but on top here is fringe vocabulary. Because at first, when I first started, I started simple. I just did it at snack time. Then I wanted to use it more, so we went to circle time. Well, at circle time, we talk about you know my turn, and we do colors, and we do shapes, and we do the weather. So. That's one nice thing with the Pixon is that you then can bring in those topic things that were over here on that other slide, not just have the core vocabulary, you can have some supplemental vocabulary that's going to fit your situation. So your fringe vocabulary could be very different from my fringe vocabulary. It depends on what your setting is. So I had that and then I realized, oh, wouldn't it be great to be able to talk about the students? So can talk about you know Sammy or you can talk about Johnny to Eleanor and be able to talk about that at circle time or at free play or whatever. So I just barely put this in and it is the pictures of the children in our classes. Maybe. Okay. Sorry. Do you have any pictures of staff on there as well? You could do staff. That would be another great thing to do. And that's probably something I'll have to do next. <laughs> that's, that's, a really, that's a really good idea. Yeah, really good idea. Okay. So Mary, if you have a really low, low functioning child, uh -huh. um, that say, like I'm thinking of this boy that, um, well he's be very young for one thing, um, and he also has severe CP, and so he's not making, he, he can't control anything right uh -huh. now. Is that still something we would work toward by maybe just having them start to get something or yeah it would have you'd have to we'd have to think about it as, as your classroom team what would be the most effective way it could be eye gaze mm -hmm. so you could do a board and you kind of separate segments of the board <coughs> into four different areas so they train them to look um, but using aided language stimulation like Amy was pushing you'd still be modeling that for that child all the time right yeah and then you had to figure out how they could then demonstrate and communicate. And have you started with a board that's been less than 20? I have not. You can, though, another thing that um, Gail suggests is to do masking. Sometimes it's appropriate to put a sheet of this and cut out just the ones you're working on. So, for instance, when I first started, we worked on health a lot. And we did, um, I put the toys they wanted in something they couldn't get into, so they had to ask them for help, help. If, 
The big board was too distracting. I could mask everything but that. Okay, another strategy that Gail talks about is introducing it as a single icon picture first. Mm -hmm. And so they start to learn to recognize that and show them help, help, help. And you could put a Velcro thing right there and show them and direct them to where it is on the table. So there's a lot of different strategies um, that can be used. Okay, so here's just a, a picture here of the 20 board and the 30 board. All right, so now I'm gonna give you a few little examples of some students. Um, student D entered in our, our class in November of 2014. And he was using one-word utterances and two-word carrier phrases that were kind of rote things that he had learned. His IEP goal was to use two-word phrases. So he was able to follow requests with gestures, match and sort colors and shapes, and point to pictures in a book. Well, it got to be like February, and he was not progressing on this goal beyond imitation. So, okay, so I'm gonna start this program. We wanted to do it. So we started using Pixon at the end of February of last year. By April, so in just two months, he was using the Pixon just as a visual support to produce three to four word verbal phrases. So like, I want a cookie, I want this cookie. So he could say them, but he'd kind of forget, like a lot of the kids, haven't you heard, heard him say, um, I cookie? They just skip the want. But this now, they have something like a marker. Okay, I want, and it fills in the space so they know they have to fill that in. And it, that, so that really helps them. Um, but so he was verbalizing and doing this, and now, this next year, I mean, he doesn't have to use the system at all. He's just, he's just speaking three, five, six word utterances. He's doing great. And I have a little video of him. Oh. So watch, he's going to be talking and he's going to be pointing um, to what he wants. Okay, so I want this. And so again, with a, uh, with a vo core vocabulary, you don't have to name each thing. We've got a this and a that, see on the board. Um, but you can also then, like it was a pretzel, I want this pretzel. So you don't have to have pictures of every single thing. You just have to have a little pretzel there that they can talk about. Pretzel. Okay, so here's another student. She was a selective mute, and um, she her cognitive function was very uncertain because of her mutism. She played by herself. She rarely interacted with peers. She answered simple WH questions by pointing to pictures. She would not verbalize. When she did, oh, she loved Paula Joe. <laughs> she would verbalize to Paula Joe, and she would walk out the room and do full sentences with her mom. But we could not measure anything in the class. It was very, very frustrating. Um, we used a talk tablet with the pictures of kids uh, for her to say hi to in circle time. So that was one of the goals her mom really wanted her to be able to say hi to her friends. No way she was going to say it verbally. Um, and when she did talk, um, it was very quiet. She just very whispered. It was really hard to understand her. So we started using Pixon with her basically because it had worked with other students. And it was like, well, what the heck? We got we to try something. And um, so again, we started at end of February, beginning of March. And by the end of April, she was starting to use it, and she would using the board at snack time to request food like want such and such, which was, she would just sit there at snack time. She was not motivated to really ask for anything. She would just sit there and, unless we just gave it to her. So, um, I mean, that, was, that doesn't seem like much, but it was huge. <laughs> it was really huge to have her do that. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. All right, so now you think, oh, these kids are all pretty high. Of course, it's gonna work with kids who are high. Oh, they, that's easy. Well, this student has Down syndrome, and she was also a native Spanish speaker. <laughs> so you add two things that are gonna kind of impact the communication. She was cognitively, she was matching 
sort and matching and sorting by color. She was very, very passive. She loved to play with the baby doll and kitchen pretend. Um, I think she might be at Highland Park. <laughs> I can't remember where she was in. Uh, but she had no verbal output. She wasn't babbling. She rarely vocalized. So nothing. So we started. We started with Pex. Again, I love Pex, and I still think Pex is a great way to go, especially for kids with autism who are not initiating. It's it was made for those kids. So don't discount Pex. But we wanted to switch to Pe Pixon and see how it would work with her. So two months later, two months later, just two months later, she was using I want this or that more again and all done. A lot more than we'd seen previously the whole rest of the year. So let me show you her. First thing that she's going to do, see there's usually we would put um, a piece of cookie here and there for that and for this, and the juice would be over here for it. Well, we are waiting for her. I don't get rid of that. Anyway, we were waiting for her. There was nothing there. So we are waiting for her to tell us that she wanted more. And I should tell you, we've got more, and we've got again on the picture board. That's so while I'm thinking of it. We use more for quantity. We want more of something. Again is when we want a repetition of an activity. Okay, so it's important to kind of distinguish between those two. Okay. Signed it and then she touched it. I want this. So you don't require verbal outfit, just. We will, I mean, if they do. Just take whatever you get. Yeah, that's communicating. Yeah. That's making a request. It does not have to be verbal. But of course, we allow for that and want to encourage that, but. And we model it. And you're always modeling, always modeling verbal. Yeah. What? I was just going to say, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is so much effortful and so much more time than it is to say it here. That once we get it here, kids drop it off. Like this is so much more efficient. Right. And they'll drop it as soon as they can go to this. But if they're saying, <clears throat> if she could say more, but she's not saying, I want this. We still want to model and encourage her to use that for the longer utterances. Okay? And it's still, even if she said more, I might even point to the picture of more. Yeah, want more. So we're building. So when I use the board, I don't point to pictures everything I say. I only, if the child is using one word utterances, I do maybe two pictures. Just like you do with language modeling, whatever the child's doing, you just want to do one or two words more than what they are doing. Because it just, it's too much. And you can't figure out well, where are you going with that. So just model just above where they need to be. Sarah, did you have a uh, question? Yeah, really quick. So I was wondering, so to have her do the I want and then take it, do you like hand over hand practice with her? Oh yeah, just at first we did. We, we practiced with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, oh, you guys have to go? Okay, because <laughs> okay, we were just going to do the fun part with all the toys. <laughs> you were going to practice. <laughs> okay, so the benefits of the core vocabulary in my mind is, one, you can use a variety of pragmatic functions. That is, to me, is huge, to be able to have the child do that. Um, it's adaptable to a lot of different situations and activities. It's easy to pick up and take with you. You can adapt it with that fringe vocabulary to your own situation. Um, easy for other people to learn. Um, the adult communicative partner can model the desired language, so using aided um, language stimulation, which is so key and so important. You can have little conversations that take place, and the pictures can represent more than one meaning. So that's why I like the, I actually like the board better than I would like if the board was on top tablet or proloquo because you're going to hit the picture and it's going to speak to you and it's only going to say help. If you want to say, oh, do you want to be a helper? It's not going to say helper because you want it to mean helper now. It's only going to say help. But with the board, you can have it say whatever you want. Like for instance, on the, the good, I use that for 
good. I use that for yummy. I use it for funny. I use it for do you like that? Because on the 20 picture, we don't have like, it doesn't come on until the 30 picture. So you can use it for a lot of different things. Okay, and the student can too. Okay, so how do you do it? Well, I'm gonna show you a video um, of Gail doing it with a group of kids. And I think, I want you to keep in mind and think about what she is actually doing. Let's see, I have some questions that we can remind you to think about. Okay, what did you notice about what she's doing and about how the kids are responding? Okay, so just think about that as we look at this video. Okay, I just wanted to say she's doing like a, a an activity doing a craft. And so again, she's just using whatever situation is she has in her classroom, whatever planning she's done, and she hasn't done a special board for that. She's just implementing the board during this activity, all right? And so the activity, we're uh, supposed to be language-focused classrooms, right? We're supposed to be doing language all the time. Well, we need to be able to do it during our small groups, our centers, or whatever we're doing and implement this. And so she's showing us how to use it with a, a core vocabulary board. What you do is all that with your voice. You voice know what we're going to do. All we're going to do what we're going to See, there's the physical prompt in hand over You want to know what are we going to do? Take a look. Uh -oh. Who wants to be the person who wants to look? You did. Who? Me. Whoever wants to look needs to raise your hand. You want to look. Who? What's the word look? Who wants to look? You want to look? You want to look? You want to look what's in the box? See, she's saying a lot of words, but only pointing to one picture. Because that's all You're he can handle. To, are you right or left hand? We don't write, but we write. You're going to, with your eyes, look. I have a two bucks. Look. 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 Did you look? How about you stand? Look. Look at what's in the box. You look. All right. You see what's in the box? Oh, I'm actually looking at You gonna look? Yeah. All right. You can look, right? How about this gentleman? Are you? I just wanted to point out that this kid just beforehand, he didn't point to the board because I think he has verbal language. He said, yeah, I want to look. Yeah. So she modeled for him, but she didn't require him to use it because he doesn't need it. You can look. You want to look. All right. Take a look. So she's really teaching what and look. Okay, that's what she's focusing on teaching right now. Awesome. Can we do our craft when things are in the box? I think we need to take them out. Out. See how she's using an individual like Out. Okay, so. Out. 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 Good thing. Out. Lammy. Out. 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 
board right there. She doesn't have to run, oh, where is that picture of I don't like that? Um, it's right there available, whatever is happening. All right, the screaming no. You talk to me. I did not like that. There. I did not like it. All right, but it's your turn. Right there, you are saying to me, I want to see something else. You need to wait. You need to wait. You need to wait. I hear you, but you need to wait. Yes, I know you do not like that, but you need to wait. You need to keep your wait card right there. Your wait. Sammy says, I can take something. Okay, we're going to wait, and we're going to stop there right now. Now, on the 20 picture board, there is no picture of weight. What would you do? What would you do? What other picture could we use to indicate weight? Stop. 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 Yeah. You can do, but you don't have to say stop. You can say wait. Wait. You need to wait. Okay? So you can use the same picture to have a different meaning and to give him something to communicate with. Okay? You to model. Okay, so now what I want to do is practice makes perfect. So I've got some fun little objects. I want you to experience how to use this board, okay? So I'm going to pass these out. I do have extra copies here too. I don't know how many we've got floating around. But I want you to get into pairs, okay? And I want you to come up and pick something. Here's a great thing for what. You know, because you don't know what's inside. We've got the act action game, throwing this into a, a bucket. We've got our little singamajig. So I just want you to have an experience of okay, what can I use? I, th this child is playing with this toy. How can I model some language using my core vocabulary? This child has this toy. Because you don't know what they're going to pick up, right? You gotta be ready to be able to do something all the time. So, some really good ones. Let's see if I can go back. Let me show you. Okay. I want to go. I've started using this board um, at our language group in circle time. And we can't use all of the pictures at circle time. And I'm not sure, I might want to go to something like this because it's it, with a smaller board because it might be a little more portable. Because I'm down on the floor usually with the preschoolers and they, they have to keep popping up. But we can do a lot of things like, okay, are you ready? Okay, we do an activity, we can say, let's do it again. We can say, we're all done with that one. We're gonna do something different, okay? Different. What's it gonna be? What's it gonna be? Okay, so, and then we're, we can say, oh, we're gonna, <laughs> smart board thing, we're gonna stop. And then we've got the all done and all. Oh, 
do I get rid of this, guys? And the smart one people, oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, did you like it? Did you like that one? Or was it good? Nah, didn't yeah. like it. Okay. So that's what I want you to do with these little activities. I want you to figure out what can you use the board to say when the child's picked this particular toy. Okay. So come on up. Grab a toy, grab a board, and we're going to have, and you can do more than one, because then afterwards I want you to tell me what boards you were able to use with that activity, okay? Okay, let's bring it back. I want you guys to, everybody tell me something they taught, show us what the toy was and what you did. Okay, well, we have, we have a comment more than, okay. than anything that... Um, why would you have no and not? Okay, because a lot of it is don't. Like so. <laughs> don't talk. Yeah. <laughs> that Where's that don't face? stop. You can have um, don't do it. Okay, so you can use the don't. Um, they even say they don't have a same. I don't know if there's a same on here. Yeah, but there is a the 30, mine 20 and 30 right don't there. have same, and so in the manual they say to use not different, which I don't think I'd use. <laughs> um, so I don't want, don't want that. I don't want more. Okay. I kind of wanted that first too. Instead of no more, two. just I don't want more. Yeah. Or so and so's not here was my yeah. example. Yeah, not here. Yeah. yeah. And if you have the fringe vocabulary, oh, Jason's not here. Okay. What did you guys do, Christina? Christina's just going to tell a story too. Okay. I was just thinking, like a lot of the, a lot of our kids that are verbal, like really like this too, because they'll they'll be sitting next to a kid that has it, and they they'll be watching the kids do it, and they like to do like the bad or the good. They'll say bad, bad. And they love it, and they, I think it helps them, too. So. Right. And we've noticed this, we've just been doing this on the board during the language group for a couple of weeks, and the verbal kids want to come up when they see us. It's the power of modeling. They want to come up, and they want to touch the pictures and show us how to do it. So it's just powerful, the modeling. Yeah. Um, there was a little gal you guys saw the picture of up during lunch, um, a little girl with Down syndrome, so cute. And so I've been modeling with her because she really, she signs 20 words or something that doesn't have much language besides that. And so I'm modeling to her and she's, she doesn't get what she's supposed to, like specific words, but she knows she's supposed to touch it. So it's kind of like babbling, right? Blah, 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 blah. It's touching the pictures. So within, she's only been with us two weeks and she already knows that she's supposed to touch. I was just going to say, I think the GoTox is a device that we have that to put a board on that would be fun for that babbling experience where mm -hmm. during that free play, you just throw a couple of those out and the kids who just like to touch can hear mm -hmm. the word said with the GoTalk with it for the board that would also help them learn the board, kind of like mm -hmm. the, the babbling, but they'd get an auditory reinforcement for it. Yeah. Okay. What did you work on? Uh, we were playing with different toys, we actually use the board to say, I want something different. <laughs> so we pick something different off the table. Okay. So with, you know, wind up toys, I want to do it again, or I want more. I want, you know, you've got shaving cream activity and they can say, I want more because that's a quantity. I want more of that. Or they're playing bowling. I want to do it again. Um, anybody else come up with other things, innovative ways to use it? Liz, Lisa? I think it's helped a lot of our kids too. Like when we bring it over to circle time in different areas, um, like Harlow for instance, like I think it helps him sit down and focus and we're like, you know, we've, we've been using all your get ready, it's time to get ready. And he just, that board, the board and that symbol just helped him sit down and focus and he knows it's time to get ready and it's time to listen. So mm -hmm. I think that's helped too. Um, I did mention that I've put some just single icons right by the door where the kids leave. We tried to use the whole board, but they would get they would get lost as the kids are getting their coats on and their backpacks and everything. And I wanted it's the perfect place. They can't get their backpacks on themselves. They can't get their coats on or zip up to ask for help. And I printed out the icon for go because it's not on here. And then I did um, ready. 
And so I, we can ask for help and we can say, um, it's, are you ready to go? So ready to go. And there's one other one I put on there. I can't remember what it is. But so it's right there in that spot. We don't need a whole board, but we're gonna use these few words right there consistently over and over again. So let's have them use it right there. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna finish right here. This. Okay. All right, so um, be sure and realize to give yourself time that you can't implement everything. Like I, like I said, it was like October when I got the fringe vocabulary. There's just the first, the polite words, the colors, the shapes, and the weather. And it was just now that I decided, oh, I need to have the kids' pictures and probably get our, our teacher pictures on there too. So just add it as you can. Move along, see successful, because success breeds success, right? When you start to see it working, we all get excited because we want to implement it with our kids. Um, so start at, you know, one particular time during the day where you're going to use it all the time and be modeling all the time. Because you've got to learn to know where the pictures are too, so that you can do it more fluidly and more quickly. Um, and then what, what our vision is, is that if we can start it at preschool, and then when the kids go to Highland Park, that, you know, you're using it too, and you've already, oh, so you know, oh, what board were they using? Oh, they are using the 20, they were using the 30 board. And then they can continue to do it. So you don't start all over again. You not any idea what the kids are able to do. So that's kind of what we'd love to see, is that continue on, and we're not all starting from scratch every single time. Um, there's some resources. Um, you can go to this menspeak.com teachers. Let's see if I've got that. Right here. And they have this intervention planning. And under intervention planning, they've got Pixon Project Resources. So that's a place to get some ideas and so forth. But remember, they're using the menspeak symbols with the naked man going into the tub. <laughs> <laughs> and they also, because it's PRC, they're using a lot of high-tech devices, okay, to do it. But we don't need that. We can be very, very successful using a low-tech device. And you reach our kids. Paula Jo? Can, can you show these guys where, where you said that you do have these forms on four grade for share? Mm -hmm. I, will, I will put them there, or I can send them the link because they're... Okay. They're not on the, the one on board maker activity share is the 30 picture board. They kind of use different colors and the pictures are in different, like stop is in the middle. It's still green, but it's kind of in the middle. Mine I rearranged. So I could, I think there's a Salt Lake City site though. There's a Salt Lake City group and I could post it to them, to that. Okay. okay. So you, you could just email me if you want that and then I could get it on there. Liz? That was my question. What if we want some of these resources? Could you email them to us? Yeah. So. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, Paula Jo, you want to talk just quickly sure. for 10 minutes? That would be great.